This paper is entitled, Another World, William Burke Cope on Primary and Secondary Causation. It comes to us from Dr. Fred Sanders, who is Professor of Theology at the, in the Tory Honors Institute at Biola University, where he's taught since 1999. Uh, we know him through his work. My children uh, know him through his Dr. Do, uh, sorry, Dr. Doctrine's Christian Comics. Uh, the rest of us know him through his work on the Doctrine of the Trinity and Christology and um, theological interpretation of Scripture. He, along with Oliver Crisp, has serves as a co-founder and organizer of the annual Los Angeles Theology Conference. He blogs regularly at Scriptorium Daily, and we're pleased to have pleased to have Fred with us today. Join me in welcoming Fred Sanders. Well, it's great to be here. This is actually my first visit to TEDS, and uh, the weather is truly impressive. <laughs> All right, um, William Burt Pope's three-volume compendium of Christian theology, uh, circa 1881, uh, is a carefully wrought dogmatics emphasizing the organic unity of Christian thought and the deep continuity of the entire Christian tradition. Pope's doctrine of creation programmatically distinguishes between the divine act of primary creation, God's calling all things into existence, and the divine work of secondary creation, the formation of an ordered universe. The former, Primary creation is the realm of metaphysical inquiry and apologetic argumentation. Scripture chooses to say little about it, and science can say nothing in principle. Secondary creation, on the other hand, is the domain of both the biblical account and of scientific investigation. This paper examines how Pope deploys the distinction in order to preserve the main lines of a Christian systematic theology, and then considers the usefulness of Pope's distinction for a Christian doctrine of creation today. Now, Pope's not exactly a big name, uh, but I come here to praise him, and I'll, my first section will introduce him a little more fully than would be necessary for someone like Schleiermacher or Warfield. So, introduction. W.B. Pope and the Broad Expanse of Catholic Evangelical Truth. William Burt Pope, 1822 to 1903, was described in 1942 as preeminently the Methodist theologian of the 19th century. And then in 1985, Alan P. F. Sell added that even today, the last four words could be omitted without injustice to anyone else. That is, Pope continues to stand forth as the preeminent Methodist theologian in the entire tradition. Sell goes on, he is the warmly devotional exegete who brings from the store of scripture things new and old and builds them into an impressive system. Systematicians are thin on the ground in the history of Methodist theology. So even just trying puts him in a select class. But succeeding is what really makes him worth commendation. Indeed, Pope was not only the greatest doctrinal theologian ever to take up the task of teaching Christian theology from the point of view of the Wesleyan revival movements, but ranks among the best practitioners of Christian theology from any confessional group in modern times, I assert. To explore his three-volume compendium is to engage in serious theology with one of the masters. Pope excelled at stating the large main ideas of Christianity, which makes it difficult to summarize what is distinctive about his theology. Thomas Langford, in Practical Divinity, hazarded this characterization. The central idea in Pope's thought was that of divine grace as affected in human life by the Holy Spirit. If that just sounds like mere Christianity rather than an identifiable school of thought, Pope would not be upset by that characterization. He was trying to fill the office of a theological teacher, passing on what the church has always taught. And he wanted his work to be judged with questions like, is it clear and memorable? Does it lead readers into a deeper understanding of scripture? Is it a faithful restatement of the great tradition of Christian thought? Does it spend the right amount of time or the right number of pages on the most important things, putting less important items in subordinate places. Starting on the first page of his compendium, Pope admonishes his readers of the dignity and sanctity of the study of theology. He says, it is a deo de deo in deum, from God in its origin, concerning God in its substance, and it leads to God in all its issues. With a meaning far more than just etymological, Pope declares of theology, 
his name is in it. So it's not just the theos there, but it's actually a biblical theology of the name of God in the idea of this sort of study of God. Pope goes on, hence, every branch of this science is sacred. It is a temple which is filled with the presence of God. From its hidden sanctuary, into which no high priest taken from among men can enter, issues a light which leaves no part dark, save where it is dark with excess of glory. Therefore, all fit students are worshipers as well as students. The remembrance of this must exert its influence upon our spirit and temper in all of our studies. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Well, I gave you the is obviously homiletic, but the work throughout is conceptually rigorous, which delivers it from being naively devotional. Those who have immersed themselves at length in the compendium might testify that the integration of theology and spirituality there is more like something patristic than more like something merely devotional in the modern idiom. Langford says of Pope that there wasn't much in his theology that could not already be found in Wesley or the Methodist theologians like Clark and Watson. Langford says, the distinctive quality of Pope's writing lay in his style of expression, his lucidity, and his completeness. Sell goes on to add that, uh, Alan Sell goes on to add that Pope was ever the constructive systematizer. And he found a place for everything and gave great attention to the grand lines of the doctrinal system. Why, if Pope was such a master practitioner, has his fame dropped so precipitously? Why is he neglected and left unread? It's tempting, uh, why is he not in print? It's tempting to say that he was too good a theologian for the time he was born in. He produced a serious Methodist Christian theology at a time when the Methodist movement was trying to figure out a way to be less serious and less Christian. <laughs> he also produced an ironic synthesis at a time marked by, um, I'm sorry, uh, he also produced an ironic synthesis uh, marked by balance and proportion at a time when there was a felt need for short, sharp polemics on the anti-Calvinist front. Pope was calmly and coolly anti-Calvinist eager to show that the main lines of the Christian tradition were on the side of the Methodists, or vice versa, the Methodists were on the side of the great Christian tradition. He took the long view, and he wrote with the goal of forming the overall theological understanding of his students. They did not often reach for their volumes of Pope when they were in a sharp knife fight with the Calvinists. Langford hypothesizes that one of the reasons for the eclipse of Pope's work is that Pope found his voice in the mid-19th century, but only published in the later 19th century. Things had changed already in his lifetime. Darwinism had come along in that time and become established, and many theologians became convinced that Christianity had to be restated within a thoroughly evolutionary framework. The tide of historical criticism of the Bible was rising rapidly during these decades, and again, the younger generation was certain that responsible theology had to take the assured results of the latest critics into account. Pope, for whatever reasons, serenely declined the invitation to take part in the panic and scramble that animated so much Victorian intellectual life of faith. In his teaching position, he was isolated from the newer currents in British intellectual life, Darwinism and idealistic philosophy. Whatever the cause, uh, Sell says, no, I'm sorry, uh, Langford says, Pope was not engaged in the swirl of Victorian struggles with religious doubt, the new dynamic of biblical criticism, the changing philosophical scene with the rise of idealism, or the transforming power of evolutionary ideas in all fields. His position was formed prior to the 1860s, the critical period for many of these issues. And although the compendium was published in 1875-1876 in its first edition, he was not responsive to the new currents that had come about in that phase of his own life. Catholic in his range of sensitivity to, to traditional Christian positions, Pope was uncongenial toward contemporary developments, although a slight familiarity with Friedrich Schleiermacher's theology is evident throughout his work. It may be that Pope was simply out of touch with the recent developments, or you could pity the midlife theologian who writes late in life and can't catch up with what everyone's doing now. Or it may be that he had in fact taken the measure of these new developments and decided they just didn't force themselves on the consideration of a theologian in the same way that the big central doctrines did. Trinity, incarnation, atonement kept the theologian busy. Langford admits that one factor in his disconnect from contemporary controversies was his conservative disposition 
and his tight focus on biblical truth. And he only had three volumes to work with, so you can't do it all. Pope was a British Methodist, a little different animal from an American Methodist, and his overriding concern was to keep the Methodist theological tradition solidly connected to and in conspicuous continuity with the main stock of historic traditional Christian doctrine. It's a good goal for anyone. Um, as a Methodist in the UK, he would have been a dissenter. Um, so it, it, you got to kind of refigure that um, going from the American context. Um, for various reasons, some Wesleyans and Arminians have preferred to see themselves as something brand new that God is doing on the face of the earth and have often approached theology as if it needs to be started from scratch now that the Wesleyans are here. Sometimes that's expressed just as anti-Calvinism, but often as anti-Augustinianism, and in the extremes it shows up as anti-scholasticism or an antipathy to the theology of the great central tradition. This impulse has not been good for Wesleyan theology, such as it is. Pope's compendium is especially designed to show how Methodist theology is one of the voices that sounds alongside the others in the same Christian family of doctrine. He is sometimes harder to read than Watson and Miley because he writes more artfully. Miley and Watson are good, too, and are not, for the most part, guilty of the tendencies I described above to be schismatic. But for constructive doctrinal purposes, Pope has the grander vision of the unity and the continuity of Christian doctrine. He was once commissioned to write an essay explaining the distinctiveness and peculiarity of Methodist doctrine, a task he was glad to undertake, but which he necessarily shaped to his own ends. We have to say a few words upon certain peculiarities in the doctrinal position of Methodism, he began, but, and he immediately changes the subject, it is a pleasant preface to dwell for a moment on the broad expanse of Catholic evangelical truth concerning which Methodism has no peculiarities or no peculiarities that affect Christian doctrine. And in his next sentence, he launches into the shared creation theology of the Christian church to begin where all things have their beginning with the being, triune essence, and attributes of God, his relation to the universe as its creator and providential governor, his revelation of himself in nature, this supreme truth it holds against all atheism, anti-theism, pantheism, and materialism. So it's here with the shared Christian doctrine of creation and its antithesis to other cosmological theories that we turn from meeting our theologian to taking up his proposal for creation theology. So part two, primary and secondary creation in Pope's theology. Pope's doctrine of creation programmatically distinguishes between the divine act of primary creation in which God calls all things into existence from nothing and the divine work of secondary creation which is, he calls cosmogenesis, the formation of an ordered universe. Uh, Pope says of the doctrine of creation that the revelations of scripture on this subject may be distributed under the two heads of the creator in regard to the act of creation and the several orders of the creatures as the result of his creating act. So kind of from the creator's side and from the creature's side. What Pope emphasizes is the singleness of God's one creative act on the one hand, um, uh, the creator in regard to the act, singular, of creation, uh, and the multiplicity of ordered, layered, sequenced creatures on the other, the several orders of the creatures as the result of his creating act. The unity of the creative act he contrasts with the multiplicity of created entities. Both are true and posited by scripture, but they demand for Pope distinct treatment and this distinct treatment orders Pope's account of creation. For one thing, primary and secondary creation display the leading divine attributes differently. In general, the creating act displays the glory of all the divine attributes, but freely as an act of the will, and with the diffusion of happiness as one end attained by the resources of infinite wisdom. But the distinction is that absolute creation is the effect of omnipotence, it shows primarily the sheer power of God to do absolutely this great thing. And on the other hand, the origination of creaturely existence is a mystery which is revealed for adoration only, no other account being given or possible but the all-sufficiency of the Creator. So the absolute omnipotence of God in the sheer production of everything from nothing, um, as that is grounded in the internal all-sufficiency of the Creator. But with secondary creation, or the formation of the material part of the universe into order, uh, we see exhibited divine wisdom also, and love as preparing the scene for providence. 
it's not that primary creation is unwise or unloving, or that God is, uh, lacks wisdom or love in the act of primary creation, uh, but that what, it, what is displayed in primary creation is omnipotence, power. It is the detailed, layered, sequenced character of secondary creation, the forming of the world, that manifests the wisdom of God and sets up the narrative dynamics in which his love is made known. Pope says, it is enough to say here that the omnipotence of God as the outward manifestation of his interior all-sufficiency is adequate for the original production of matter in what may be called absolute creation. It's another name he uses for what I'm calling primary creation, absolute creation. That his wisdom and power are seen in the secondary creation or formation of matter into worlds. And that the end of all is the expression of the divine perfections or their reflection in the works of his hands. Pope is concerned enough about Reformed theological distortions that he is cautious about his account of omnipotence and sovereignty. It may be strategic for him to do justice to the massive truths of God's power uh, and absolute sovereignty in his section on creation proper, which is the other thing that he calls absolute creation or primary creation, creation proper. Um, it is only in the divine all-sufficiency that we can find the ground of the origin of all things that exist not being God himself. In this, we must be content to seek the possibility of all forms of being. All we can say is, and here he defines uh, divine possibility, with God, all things are possible, Matthew 19, 26. That is, all things possible may, at his will, become actual. For creation proper, Pope builds a positive and a negative case. The positive case is directly constructed from the affirmations of Scripture. Pope builds an exegetical foundation from predictable texts like Genesis 1, in the beginning God created, John 1, all things were made by him, and Colossians 1, by him were all things created, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. But he especially leans into Romans 1, which he calls a very remarkable passage, in which St. Paul declares the possibilities of God to be ta aorata autu, the invisible things of him. What he, in the freedom of his omnipotence, brings into visible existence, proclaims his eternal power and Godhead, says Pope. And then, Pope examines the relation between power and Godhead carefully. The dunamis here proceeding and measuring, and as it were, determining the theotes, uh, the theoetes, while on the other hand, the theoetes, or divineness of God, is the substratum of that dunamis, the resources of which are infinite. What interests Pope here in Romans 1 is the essential recesses of divinity in itself as the fund of creative power outwards, so that his power manifests his divinity. Similarly, Pope finds much in the language of Hebrews 11. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Pope fastens on this phrase, the worlds were framed, as a statement about secondary creation, that is, world framing. And the phrase about the appearing of visible things from that which is not as a statement about primary creation or the absolute origin as such. He summarizes, the construction and the absolute origination of all things seen are in fact separated and then united. The creative word of God is set over against both. So Pope finds in this passage in Hebrews 11 um, the most careful statement in which scripture approaches the formulation ex nihilo. And he believes that scripture makes the distinction between world framing on the one hand and the appearing of all things on the other hand, so that faith may lay hold of the truth, which reason cannot penetrate, that the created universe did not spring by development from things previously existing, but from the invisible creating power of one who afterwards is referred to as him who is invisible, Hebrews 11:27. According to Hebrews, according to Pope, Primary and secondary creation are distinguished and then united here precisely in order that the Christian relation to creation will be a relation of faith, one that draws the conclusion that created phenomena have a depth in God which transcends all possible created relations. This is, I think, similar to what Robert Sokolowski has described as making the Christian distinction, the theological inference drawn from worldly phenomena uh, that sets Christian revelation apart from paganisms of every kind by gesturing toward the true God. Pope's final word on this is telling. With this, the revelation of scripture has spoken its last word, after which the first word of science must begin. <laughs>
Thus far, the positive, that's the transition from primary to secondary, but first, um, thus far, the positive exegetical case for creation proper, or primary creation. Pope also builds a negative case. His negative case consists of arguing that Scripture precludes any other doctrine than that of an absolute creation of all things by the direct act of the divine will. Pope's negative case is that there simply is no other way to preserve the infinite and to us unthinkable chasm between necessary being and existence phenomenal. Uh, while he admits that, the Bible does not say in philosophical language that the unconditioned one remains the unconditioned while he created the conditioned, or that the necessary being cannot have other necessary existence, co-eternal with himself, which he forms into the universe, Pope nevertheless affirms that this is what Scripture means by what it says. He canvasses all the other options for a relation between God and the world, and not only finds them unacceptable, but finds their unacceptability to constitute the negative proof for the correctness of the Christian view. In this next section of the Compendium of Christian Theology, Pope devotes six pages to pantheism, eight to polytheism, four to dualism, and ten to materialist atheism. The root error of pantheism, he says, according, uh, uh, the root error of pantheism, according to Pope, is identifying God with the universe, or more tellingly, he puts it this way, making God supreme in it without being its creator. Pope is eager to distinguish a range of types of pantheism. All pantheism is not the same pantheism, he says. Distinguishing the religiously motivated Hindu systems from the speculative system of Spinoza, which Pope uniformly describes as cold and abstract. Um, my summaries of what he does with pantheism and polytheism are going to be very short. His descriptions of them are very long. He, Pope has a lot of, it seems, independent interest, uh, almost sort of as a history of religion in these systems as, as he looks at them. He, why he goes eight pages in some cases can't really be justified in terms of the dogmatic force that it has for a system. I think he actually just likes all the different forms of human thought and kind of dives into them and wants to make sure he's doing justice to the range, even as he sums them up under a heading like pantheism and treats them under that one category. Polytheism comes in for a long discussion, though Pope admits it's not an error against which Christian theology contends much in the modern West. In addition to having some genuine interest in the histories and cultures that produced a range of polytheisms, Pope finds that the study tends greatly to serve the cause of the Christian religion by showing the incomparable superiority of the records of Revelation. It's kind of a shot at polytheism there. Like it's studying it really makes Christianity look good because polytheism is so bad. Materialism, Pope considers the polar opposite of pantheism the philosophical or scientific antagonist of the scriptural doctrine of the creator and creation. Materialism, quote, gives matter the preeminence as the only substance that is and regards what men call God as the unknown law by which that substance is governed in all its evolutions. Materialism inverts the process uh, that we trace in pantheism and makes an organism in which matter exhibits its perfection in the phenomena of thought and conscious personality. Modern speculation on this subject differs generally from the ancient in consequence of the modern being constructed on, uh, of the ancient being constructed on a theory that does not necessarily exclude a personal God as the origin of all life. Pope says, placing God at the ultimate point where life originated, uh, the ancients regard the evolution of all the forms of life as the operation of forces impressed upon matter or even constituting matter itself. Later, in a treatment of biological evolution, Pope will draw back to his observation about materialism. When evolution depends on materialist metaphysics, Pope unleashes his full scorn on it. Alan Sells says that, quote, the impersonality of the evolutionist's fundamental principle was what especially struck Pope, and he waxed lyrical about it. Um, so here's, here's Pope on uh, materialistic evolution. Men persuade themselves to accept a law of silent, ceaseless evolution, ruling in the economy of things, to which one's one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. See how patiently they wait upon the slow travail of millennia and cycles of ages, watching the disappointments of nature as feebler types perish, and allowing vast periods of time for every new and better feature to be stamped on the ascending creature. Their language is not thou, Lord, but thou, law, in the beginning didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens and the, are the work of thine hands. I say, let us learn to confirm our faith by their irreverent unbelief. While they abase their minds before a dread irrational necessity or force, 
and patiently wait upon it, let us humble our minds before the eternal majesty of wisdom in the patience of the saints. With his rejection of alternative systems, and especially of materialism, Pope concludes his treatment of absolute creation, or primary creation. Turning to secondary creation, the biblical teaching about the formation of the varied contents of the world, Pope says, it is necessary to establish a distinction between the first production of matter and its subsequent elaboration, if such a term may be used, into the cosmos, which brings us into the region of cosmogony, or cosmology. Whereas Pope referred to the product of primary creation as being, or that which is, um, and sometimes he would call it matter and admit that there was no biblical word for it, he consistently uses the word world to mean a formed or crafted set of creaturely things in relation to each other and to God. I think he's doing etymologically the connection between cosmos and either order or beauty, you know, depending on how you trace that word. Pope thinks that this distinction is intimated in Genesis 1's use of the double expression, God created and God made, which he says seems significantly to indicate a distinction which is not clearly defined in the text. Pope has much to say in interpretation of the Mosaic cosmogenesis, the story of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. His exegesis of the passage is rich and interesting, and he goes out of his way to consider the possibility that this is only the account of this world because he takes the Bible's phraseology to suggest the possibility of multiple worlds, either further back in time and buried by cycles and sequences of development, or so remote in outer space that they need not be considered part of our world, regionally speaking. So he seems to be like old, old, old Earth. Um, or maybe have a theology of extraterrestrials. I'm, I'm not sure what he, but he keeps emphasizing this other worlds kind of thing that might be contained um, in, in the word worlds in the Old Testament uh, and in the New. He also has much to say about angels, whose spiritual existence populates the vaster cosmology within which he situates the earthly account of creation. We skip over this to make some observations about his view of humanity, because that's where the primary secondary distinction exerts itself again. After his ex exegetical investigations, Pope adopts an, an intentionally defensive stance toward modern biological and anthropological accounts. Speculations as to the origin of man upon the earth have been more or less bound up with those on the origination of life generally, he says. The consideration of human evolution necessarily um, brings him back to this. Uh, all, whether they intend it or not, practically denying the creation of the human soul or spirit as a substance distinct from matter. Uh, it is impossible, uh, this is crucial for his evolution take, it is impossible so to state the theory of evolution as to preserve the integrity of the higher element in man's nature. But the true theory of that nature requires that something was superadded to the physical and immaterial life that lay behind it in the history of creation. The scriptural account is plain and express. Man was created in the image of God. Modern science will never find rest until this is acknowledged. So. The divine account of man's origin, Pope says, displaces every other account devised by man's science. Accepting the testimony, as we believe it, of the Creator Himself, we have only to stand on the defensive, and it may safely be said that no other hypothesis of the production of mankind has yet proved its case. Here we begin to see Pope's attitude toward the sciences and his position on faith and reason more broadly. Alan Sell's historical work on Pope offers some good comparative insights on this front. He says that the 19th century was a time of theological reappraisal is well known. The question of the starting point of theological, theological inquiry was up for grabs. The challenge from evolutionary thought and biblical criticism were on the front burner. And matters historia, uh, well, I'll skip that part. Um, so far, uh, so. Uh, all of these things come to the fore in the intellectual climate of Pope's time. Pope has a side which seems congenial to rational philosophical argument. His philosophical, uh, but philosophical may be the key word here, congenial to rational philosophical argument. He accepts the utility of theistic arguments. He thinks they work. The being of God is at once an innate idea and a truth demonstrable and to be demonstrated, he says. But, he says, there is a limit um, to the demonstrative force of the proofs as human evidences. They require the enforcement of the Holy Spirit's influence as divine credentials. Alan Sells says of Pope's apologetic, he stands ultimately for the priority of revelation. This, after all, is the biblical stance. It is certain that it is more after the manner of the Bible to set out 
uh, the credentials of revelation itself than to array a number of internal and presumptive evidences in the absence of the testimony of scripture. Um, Sell has a footnote there which kind of tries to place uh, Pope in between the sort of inheritors of Butler's apologetics, or we might talk about evidentialism, um, and presuppositionalists like Van Til, or he mentions Kuiper a little bit. Pope's general position is that the theistic arguments simply confirm what the believer has already perceived by the Spirit through the Word. And then Sell adds, in this respect, the Arminian is a true son of Calvin. Sort of a low blow there. It remains to note Pope's final distinctive emphasis. Not surprisingly in a Methodist, um, it is upon the confirmatory role of the believer's experience that he insists. Um, Sell points out that in a sermon to 16 newly or in a charge to 16 newly ordained ministers, Pope said, remember that you are to proclaim a religion of clear demonstration. Now you have to figure out what clear demonstration means um, as Pope's talking to ordained Methodist ministers. Your future course will be very much shaped by the theory you form for yourself in the matter of evidences. If you resolve to let the internal at all points verify the external and live by that law, you will be a happy man. Dare to expect that the transcendent revelations of the gospel shall be revealed over again in you and thus prove their truth beyond the possibility of gainsaying. This is from a book called The Inward Witness. Um, Sell points out, Pope, in other words, knew that the business end of proving the truth of Christianity would be an experiential demonstration of the power of God in a transformed life. Pope was on guard against mere subjectivism, but the weight of his apologetic definitely did not fall on something like argumentation or evidence used public, using publicly available truths and standards of proof. He was true to the red-hot, born-again, evangelical Methodist experience as the thing that would prove the case. On evolution, Pope accepted the idea of development broadly, but contends that the very intricacy of the processes to which the scientists point requires belief not in an impersonal force, but in a personal God of creativity. Speaking before the British Association for the Advancement of Science, Pope said, quote, the revelation of natural science cannot contradict the revelation of spiritual science. So kind of an incipient two books uh, uh, correlation there. Much of the fideistic tone can be accounted for by Pope's reaction against the infidelity spreading, in, not in society at large, but in his church and in the theological centers of his time. It was hard going for dissenters at the end of the 19th century, uh, dissenters of any kind. The Baptists were having trouble. Um, in a funeral address on the Reverend John Lomas, Pope praised the, his theological teacher for impressing upon a considerable number of students, quote, the claims of systematic or dogmatic divinity in opposition to the latitudinarian, characterless negation of belief that has been creeping in among us. In his inaugural address as teacher at Didsbury College, Pope said, wherever we turn our glance upon Christendom, we perceive the manifold signs of a steady, persistent, ruthless, and thorough determination to bring the Christian faith and its holy documents and its equally holy institutions before the bar of a reason that will know nothing of faith. Uh, this is where he turns his gaze in Christendom. Seeking to rob the Old Testament scriptures of the marks of their divinity as from God and of their historical worth as from man. He goes on to use phrases, it's a long section, so I just some key phrases here, fleshly license, irreverent principles, etc. Um, no man, this is a downgrade controversy that he's seeing from the perspective of Methodism, and he just sees as a constant attack within the church on the supernatural uh, principles of Christianity. No man can be a genuine disciple of Christ, he says, who does not receive the holy oracles at God's hands as a testimony to himself given by God's own spirit to the prophets before he came and by his own spirit to the apostles after he departed. Our Lord makes the volume, he says, of Scripture. What Sell does not notice is that Pope's distinction between primary and secondary creation gave him the ability to balance faith and reason in the following way. Primary creation is amenable to philosophical demonstration. For Pope, theistic arguments show that there is a creator. Uh, and Pope further believes that alternative views can be rationally argued to be incoherent or at least less satisfactory. Here we see a rationalist side of Pope's apologetic. Secondary creation plunges us into biblical revelation, and we must accept or reject the biblical testimony. Here our response to Moses is our response to God, the response of faith. A pronounced fideistic side emerges here as he defends the Mosaic cosmogony. If this works, 
Then we have rational proof of a creator on the one hand and faith regarding the genesis of the cosmos on the other hand. Even if Pope is not himself successful in striking the right balance between these two, he has put in place a useful distinction that could underwrite further attempts to do justice to the claims of both sides. And even if what he did in the middle 19th century is no longer directly available for our imitation, the primary secondary distinction could be pressed into service in our own context to meet challenges of our own time and enable a balanced Christian confession of creation. But that brings us to some constructive engagement with Pope. So some notes on employing Pope's primary secondary creation distinction uh, for theology. First, in order to reclaim it, we would need to clarify its appeal to the Bible. Uh, we will, of course, not find metaphysical distinctions of this nature in the words of Scripture. There won't be words for unformed matter or for the unconditioned or for things like that. But I believe we could argue with more confidence in the created versus making distinction in the usage of Genesis. Um, in order to render this, uh, this distinction more plausible, I think you could actually start in Genesis 1 and go a little further with it linguistically than Pope is, seems to be willing to. Second, I think that the um, distinction between primary and secondary creation has more historical warrant than Pope is disposed to rehearse. Um, there is a tradition of double creation that goes back, of course, before Christianity. You get it in the long speech in Plato's Timaeus, um, where the works of intellect bring about through the demiurge shaping the elements with the forms, etc. But then the works of necessity, which include the straying cause and the weird discussion of the receptacle of all becoming, and that then both of those have to go together to give uh, an adequate account of the world we are actually in. So that you have to kind of approach two different worlds in the one world we're in. Augustine inherits this tradition and creatively appropriates it, especially in Confessions. You can see it in a few pages with his discussion of God creating the heavens and the earth, by which, of course, Genesis means the heaven of heavens, that is, the, the world of, of pure forms, and the earth of earths, that is, unformed matter. Um, that's an, included in the discussion Augustine has of two created things that are outside of time because they're too big and too fast to be within time, that is, the first moved thing, uh, and, or is too unformed to be within time because unformed matter, just you can't track change in it because it, it doesn't have any condition T that you could use to measure to go from T1 to T2. Um, other advantages of Pope's distinction, I'm going to paraphrase this in the interest of time so we leave time for Q&A. Um, first of all, it's just helpful for organizing the material. I know this just sounds like how to work out your table of contents in a systematic theology, but it really does matter that you establish some ground lines, and I think Pope's doing this, that will buy him enough space for dogmatic concerns within the doctrine of creation. The uh, creation-creature distinction, which John Webster has argued, is, needs to be made programmatic and needs to be handled as a distributed doctrine that makes its judgments felt throughout the entire system of theology, and especially at those areas where the intimacy of salvation uh, and redemption is so great that we're tempted to transgress the creator-creature boundary. Um, that distinction lives mainly at the level of primary creation. And again, I would point to um, Sokolowski's work here, where he says that the Christian God is presented as being so transcendent to the world uh, that he could be in undiminished goodness and greatness even if the world were not. The Christian God can be distinguished from the world in this radical way. In contrast, the gods of pagan religion and the first principles of pagan philosophers are gods and principles for the world, and they could not be without the world. So even those pagan descriptions of, of transcendence are necessarily um, transcendence as the term of the world that we live in and interpret. Um, whereas Sokolowski phenomenologically wants to impress the need to make the Christian distinction repeatedly through a number of conceptual tools. That set of tools, I think, live uh, in, in the area of primary creation. John Webster has warned programmatically um, about the doctrine of creation that disarray results from the hypertrophy and atrophy. That's like the ultimate John Webster sentence beginning, right? Disarray results from the hypertrophy or atrophy of a given element. As, for example, in theologies that reduce the doctrine of creation to teaching about created things without adequate consideration of the creator and his work. Further, misperception or misapplication of this element will deform the whole whose force depends in part upon the integrity of its constituents. So again, not just as a matter of getting your systematic theology's table of contents to look tidy and orderly, but as a matter of actually securing the space for properly dogmatic considerations about the creator-creature distinction. Um, secondly, on divine attributes, um, 
Pope has a promising correlation of power with primary creation or absolute creation as such, and wisdom with secondary, with the ordering and forming of world making. God's um, creative power is better grasped in the production of everything than in the forming of all the things. And his creative wisdom is better seen in the intricate fit between means and end, part and whole, layers on layers, wheels within wheels of secondary creation or world making. Ezekiel saw both wheels within wheels and a plurality of living forms and something that looked like one sitting upon a throne. Um, third, God's life in itself. Um, explicit talk of primary creation is a helpful intermediate step moving back from a world to God. Uh, the boost of considering absolute creation in this way on the way to considering God the creator. Uh, it's not the same as the immanence transcendence distinction, but it's a helpful renaming of God's transcendent relation to each thing and to all things. Fourth, providence. Um, the distinction that we have here can do justice to God's absolute and um, uh, unrestrained power uh, without regarding omnicausality as something that functions at the secondary level um, in the course of history with all the things that we deal with. Pope denies, at one point, absolute sovereignty as being a divine attribute uh, if it's considered as working in history in an omnicausal sort of a way, because he sees history as, by definition, not absolute, but related. And God does things within it in relation to the world he has established in a way that is different from the way he does things absolutely with regard to a world he has not yet established. Um, fifth, briefly, divine, oh, I'm racing the clock here, so we have time for questions. Divine action. There are kind of two perspectives that have got to be true in divine action. One is that God is not one of the agents down here among us in the world doing things as if he's one of the players in the game. And yet, hey, he's got to be above that transcendent, you know, doing a master act above it that doesn't put him in kind of a competitive uh, situation with regard to created agents or space or forces. And yet he's also the living God who does things. Um, while these two things ought to inform each other, nevertheless, the first perspective is a way of talking about primary creation, and the second perspective uh, might have more of a home in a discussion of secondary creation. Super broad there. Um, number six, faith and reason. Uh, here we've already suggested that Pope ha makes a move parsing out the cogency of demonstrations uh, of God's existence, uh, or of something which we all, by common consent, call God, to use Thomas's terms. Um, and the need to believe in the authority of Scripture for the shaping of the world. This is not far from a kind of a, uh, some of the resources of a Thomistic account of faith and reason. Number seven, anthropology. Uh, well, let, me do, let me do this. Uh, so anthropology. Humans stand in a relation of primary and secondary createdness. So you don't have to just think of the entire universe to be thinking of primary creation. You can also just be thinking of the fact that you exist at all, why you are something rather than nothing, as opposed to why you are the particular thing you are. Um, these can be contemplated in our own selves. Each of us um, is at all because we are the subject of absolute or primary creation, and we are who we are in particular as subjects of secondary creation. Paul Tillich distinguished two kinds of non-being, ook-ontic and may-ontic. Um, he had existentialist reasons for doing this. He wanted both the ontic shock of being as such, um, and the mystery of being me and standing out against other possible uh, things I could have been. Athanasius described humans as being from nothing, and he drew a lot of theological implications from the fact that um, you've only got two options, really two alternatives, to be toward God or to be back towards the nothing from which you came. You could extend that Athanasian argument about having only two alternatives to an ookontic and meontic dynamic of our, uh, of our being. Um, the two alternatives are to be specifically me toward God or to be toward nothing. Um, to be called into existence, uh, to be called forward specifically by God, or to refuse that call. Uh, and then I'll just end with eschatology, because that's eschatology. Um, when a good habit of talking about primary and secondary creation um, could give us a, a better resonance in a habit of talking about the end of the world when we talk about eschatology, because it would alert us to the fact that we are talking about the end of this world, the end of this ordering, the redoing of this structured cosmos in some way yet to be understood. But we are not talking about the undoing of absolute creation uh, or the ceasing to be of that which is not God. Thank you. <laughs>
We do have time for some questions, and then we're going to uh, sort of uh, transition very quickly to panel discussion. But if, if first, we have questions. Steve Long right here in the front. Um, if we have a microphone coming for Steve. Fred, thank you for a, a wonderful paper. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say that even though I worked with uh, Tom Langford, I've never gotten around to reading Pope, which is, shows you how we Methodists disdain our own tradition. Um, I was fascinated by the relationship between primary and secondary causality, which I take to be a, a Thomistic idea, and primary and secondary creation. If I understand primary and secondary causality, what that means is there are genuine secondary causes, angels, nature, human beings, and they do something in the world. They make things. But, they're, but they always do it because of a primary causality. So, so in other words, with the human beings, God freely wills that human beings can freely will. So every act of speech, thought, creation is a free act of the human being and at the same time a free act of divinity. Now, uh, so there's two questions here. How does that relate then to the primary and secondary creation, which seems to be a little bit different? Mm -hmm. and, and the other is, why is it that so many Methodists and uh, other types reject that idea? Um, in my conversations with people like um, uh, Tom Ward or John Sanders, they just say that that's an illogical idea. So, so it brings metaphysical commitments of compatibilism, which seem to be difficult for some reason for contemporary theologians. Um, but without that, it seems like you do construct a kind of competitive relationship between God and creation. So I'm sure you'll agree with me that, uh, <laughs> uh, that that's actually a very uh, fruitful idea theologically. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it is, a, it is a different distinction. And I think um, insofar as Pope is going to use the two kinds of causality, the two levels of causality, um, that's going to be over in the secondary creation or the world forming, which is um, it's a statement about initial conditions, you know, um, but it's also open towards providence. So the, the transition from his discussion of cosmogenesis or world making into providence and ongoing ordering is a, it's a pretty smooth transition. And he, if he has anxieties, I'm actually not sure where Pope is on, on this. Um, generally, he has a more classical profile theistically um, than when you're, what you're going to get in later theologians. Um, if he has anxieties uh, about that sort of uh, what over over determining, or, you know, God sort of sucking up all the air and not letting anybody have any, um, he 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 eases some of those anxieties uh, in what he cedes to primary creation, in that God God does operate there uh, with that kind of uh, unrestrained, unconstrained, absolute power. Um, I, I have not caught him uh, facing the full brunt of, of something like concursus or something um, over in the rest of what he does. But I think a wide field for him to work with in, in secondary creation. Yeah. All right, we got Rebecca. Thank you, Fred. Um, picking up on one of your concluding points about the uh, divine attributes in connection to the work of creation, uh, you were saying that Pope draws out that power, particularly associated with the first and wisdom with the secondary creation. Um, as, as I read Genesis, it feels like uh, goodness is quite prominent uh, in chapter one particularly. And so I was wondering uh, if you were kind of thinking about divine attributes in creation, are you happy with Pope's mm -hmm. emphasis on power and wisdom? Is there a place or scope for drawing out divine goodness at that point? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I, I am happy. Uh, I, I'm well disposed toward what Pope has done there with the power and wisdom. You have to read it you know, non-exclusively and all of that. Um, but just to talk about what is most clearly manifested or demonstrated in which aspect or way of looking at creation. Um, I don't recall, in the context of creation, he doesn't work much with the divine attribute of goodness, um, even though it's, you know, it's, it's prominent there in the text about creation. Um, and I, so this is me kind of constructing on, if I were to use Pope's distinction, I would then use your observation about goodness and put it on both sides of things. Um, then the primary creation, you get a conspicuous display of the sort of absolute, blunt, sheer goodness of God, 
um, and that then in secondary creation and the world forming, you could really tack right in with the uh, Genesis narrative and say, you know, this is good and that's good and this is good and that's good um, as, a, as a recurring uh, thing going on. Yeah. Got Stephen Williams here. Thanks very much indeed. Just to, to piggyback on this last exchange, of course in Genesis, um, goodness is not ascribed to God. In Genesis 1, it's to the created order. He saw it was good. So would Pope defend himself along those lines, that he's extrapolating the wisdom and power is a matter of theological reflection on the basis of the text, but goodness of the goodness of God is not strictly required by the text itself because it's a property or attribute of creation. Just a thought. Yeah, yeah, another good observation. Uh, I shouldn't call that good because now that word is fraught. Um, <laughs> I, I think you're right that a divine attribute of goodness is not uh, expressly stated. There's, there's not some sort of, you know, since I am good, I confer goodness or participation in goodness. It's, you know, he made it, looked at it, saw that it was good. Um, I, as Chris Holmes has a new book out on, on the goodness of God, which um, really kind of works through this, um, certainly as a divine attribute, and then works it out into the theology of creation and salvation. Um, yeah, that, that could account for why he doesn't take that up there. His, his discussion of the divine attributes of God manifested in creation, partly driven by his whole treatment of the divine attributes that he just concluded at, in that part of volume one, um, but is partly driven by Romans one and the power of God made manifest um, and he's really in, he's working closely with that. And um, y you know how sometimes when you're reading Bart, you read five or six pages at a time and have no idea what he's talking about, and then, then it dawns on you what the key word is? And, and usually it occurred somewhere in the first paragraph, but it wasn't underlined in the English edition. Um, or maybe he doesn't use the word, you know? It's just like it was in his head, and then he generated all this incredibly productive stuff. Pope can be a little bit like that, the sort of... Um, the, the, the purple style of his writing sometimes can be, you, you, you have these questions like, why, why isn't a key word here goodness? Why, why is power and sufficiency and wisdom uh, sort of running what he wants to say here? You know, similar like Bart, you could throw another theme in there and watch him do Mozartian things with it. Uh, but it is not a theme present uh, in that discussion in the text. Christoph Schwobel has a question for us. Uh, that was a very interesting paper that um, set me thinking about this relationship of primary and secondary creation. The way in which you've uh, explained it, um, it seemed to be that um, primary creation really is a modal relationship and not a causal relationship like uh, secondary creation, which would make sense to say that a God, talking of God the creator in the sense of the primary creation means that God is the ground of the possibility of everything else. So, um, because God is actual, everything else is possible. That would be a possible um, conceptual explanation of that. And so that secondary creation would, within that framework, be concerned with um, figuring out how that condition for the possibility of everything that is influences the way causal interactions happen uh, on the worldly plane. First question is, is that a correct interpretation? Second question. Um, if that's true, then I think one is theologically committed to say that God is the ground of all possibility. He is also the end the, of all um, actuality, uh, which is, of course, the reason why Calvin seems to be evolutionary, because for him God is not only the prima causa, but also the um, finis ultimus, the ultimate end of everything that is. So God creates everything. That's where Schleiermacher got this idea from that it's all one act. Um, now, if that is true, then the interaction between created agents and God the creator uh, can never be any kind of competition. So the problem that Steve raised, for example, it is one that happens within that framework. And it's a kind of a compatibilism between modal descriptions uh, um, comprising the whole uh, first cause and ultimate end, um, and causal descriptions on the worldly plane. 
would that also be um, a legitimate um, explication of um, Pope, or is that just my theological fantasy? <laughs> um, I, I think that's a very helpful redescription uh, of what must be going on in primary creation. Um, I had not thought about calling it modal. I had thought about the difficulty of describing that, you know, that absolute act as a causation, because you have to you have to begin working up from what causation is to describe what what this transcendental causation would be. Um, it just doesn't stick as well. But what I really like about it, um, your distinction, uh, your redescription of the distinction, is it makes clearer how primary creation is continually present in secondary creation. Yeah, as, 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 I was, as I'm trying to tease them apart and try to capture what Pope's doing here, it's sort of, it can sound like first God does this thing, then he does this other mode. Um, and of course, these are two ways of analyzing what terminates on exactly one world that there is. Like primary creation is always present to us in each thing, which also has its, uh, you know, its, its history and its own genesis. Yeah. So that's helpful. Thank you. So I have, uh, I'll take the last question okay. <laughs> to sort of turn this um, a bit toward the science side of things a bit as well. So in his higher catechism of theology, so not the three volume compendium, but in the higher catechism, um, Pope has a fairly long um, discussion of evolution. Yeah. And there he talks about the possibility that there is a long evolutionary process. How long, he doesn't say, he probably doesn't know, he doesn't want to guess, but a long evolutionary process uh, through which these various broods would have risen, uh, as he calls them, to a certain point. And then finally, how does he put it? Some like, um, finally God says, in the fullness of time, I think is one of his phrases, <laughs> now, right? And God breathes into them the breath of life and bestows sort of rationality and the, the image of God on them. Do you know um, how pervasive that is in his writings? And do you know anything about the reception history of that? Um, Brad was talking about reception history among the among the uh, uh, among the Reformed and Presbyterians about what Warfield was doing with this. I was just wondering what you could tell us about um, how this was received. You, yeah. you mentioned stuff about reception history of Pope mm -hmm. early, but not about this specifically. Yeah, yeah, good. The Higher Catechism of Theology is a really strange little, it's not that little, it's three, yeah, three it's big, pages, yeah. um, but it's Delphic, you know, and, and he doesn't, so he makes the distinction there between primary and secondary, has very little to say about primary creation, in the higher catechism, doesn't do the, you know, atheism, materialism, pantheism routine, has much more to say, uh, and yeah, seems to go further. It's later in his life, he seems to go a little bit further uh, in respect to Darwinism. Very parallel to Warfield, the key thing he wants is the soul, like it's gotta be the soul, if, if you can't have that, it's not gonna work. Seems to be, uh, he doesn't put it exactly this way, but it seems to be um, coherent with the idea of like the ensoulment of the highest primate, um, you know, that this one, has the soul and is the image of God, and now we start salvation history. Um, I don't know anything about the reception history. Tom Noble says just briefly that um, Pope was an evolutionist and um, would thought, considered it uncontroversial. That's lightly footnoted there. So I think it might be unfootnoted, but Tom Noble knows a lot, so yeah. All right. Uh, thank me. Uh, thank me. There we go. <laughs> It's a long day, right? <laughs> Join me in thanking Fred. That's the way it's going to go. And if I could have...